Here it is, Lesson 18. The book introduces the fourth principle part, which would be identified by you as the participle perfect passive. Mood, tense, and voice. The fourth principle part is the participle perfect passive. The word mood is really just the word for mode in an old-fashioned pronunciation, and the participle is the mode of the verb when it is made into an adjective. So the participle is an adjective. That's really all you need to know. And for the sake of trivia and you understanding where it comes from and why we identify with mood, tense, and voice like another verb, it's because it's an adjective that is formed from a verbal root. So for example, what I mean by that is the verb love can become the adjective or participle loved. You can have the verb see become the participle perfect passive seen. You can have the verb the verb warn become the participle perfect passive or the adjective warned. For example, the boy was warned. Or for example, the missing hat was seen. Or the girl was loved. That's what a participle is. It's an adjective that's made out of a verbal stem. The participle perfect passive is translated like the examples I've given you, loved, warned, or seen. Since it's an adjective, the participle perfect passive has an adjectival lexical entry. That is to say, here's what I mean by the fourth principal part. Here's the first, the second, the third, and the dictionary. A good proper dictionary wouldn't abbreviate and it would just have amatus, amata, amatum. All the dictionaries always do abbreviate, though. They're trying to save space, I guess. And they just put something like amatus, amata, amatum. Or some textbooks just pick one of these. Some of them just pick amatum, and instead of writing the other two, they just write amatum. But remember that the amatum is the neuter form. You have the masculine, feminine, and neuter, just like any other adjective. Masculine always comes first, feminine second, neuter third. That's the participle perfect passive. Since the participle perfect passive is an adjective, it has to agree with the nouns it modifies. In case, number, and gender, that's what it's always been for adjectives. The only case where you've seen that not to be true is with the relative pronoun, but that's not an adjective. Relative pronouns only have to agree in number and gender, not in case. But adjectives have to agree in case, number, and gender every single time. Here are some examples of sentences using the participle perfect passive. I'll underline the participle perfect passive in each case so you can see, for example, that these words are being changed into different cases and endings that they um, modify the nouns that they describe, agreeing with them in case number and gender. First one says, puer a patre, vocatis respondit. It says, the boy responded, called by the father. The boy responded, and this is almost like its own little clause, called by father. Called is from the verb call, and you can tr change it into called or having been called. It's a little awkward to write having been called, although in this sentence it seems to work pretty smoothly. The boy, having been called by his father, responded. The second one says, the girl responded, having been called, wokata, by father, a patre. Wokata here is feminine because it agrees with puella. Puella is nominative, singular, and feminine. Nominative, singular, and feminine. And so wokata, the adjective, or participle perfect passive in this case, specifically, is also in the nominative singular feminine. In the first sentence, wokata is in the nominative singular masculine. Third sentence says, the gift 
given by the gods is eternal life. The gift, donum, ades datum, given, datum, that's the verb give turned into a participle perfect passive or an adjective given, give becomes given. The gift given by gods, est, is vita eterna, eternal life. The gift given by gods is eternal life. The people demanded the promised race or the promised course. Promised is the participle perfect passive. That's the adjective promise turned into the participle promised. It's the adjective promise turned into the participle perfect passive promised. The people demanded poskit corsum promissum. The course is modified by the word promised. So promised is in the same case number and gender as course. So it's in the accusative singular masculine. Next one says Atlanta carpet. This is the English word order. Atlanta carpet, the palmum yactum. Atlanta seized or snatched the apple throne or the throne apple. Either way you want to translate that. Again, you could say the having been thrown apple, but that would be a little bit funny in English. It says Atalanta carpet snatched up or took sorry snatches in the present tense Atalanta snatches the throne or the tossed apple or the apple having been thrown it's a lot of these sentences are going to be a little bit awkward in English because the Romans love to use the participle and English does not use it the same way. So a lot of these sentences, the having been thrown, the having been loved, the having been promised, the having been called, they may sound a little funny in English, I agree. You just got to get used to translating them in a way that sounds like English. I'm doing them very slowly now too, so it may also be sounding kind of funny and stiff. One more. A days. Dea adorata, actor amoris. Ade says, uh, you are near, you be near. You are, uh, be near, um, the creator of love. Dea adorata. Adorata is beloved or loved goddess. Be near me, loved goddess or adored goddess. The author of love. Just so you see it. You are near. Adored or loved goddess. Creator or author of my love. I'm not saying they're brilliant sentences, I'm not saying they're poetry or wonderful, but they are accurate models of how the Romans used the participle perfect passive. Basically, what you have to know is the participle is an adjective. For example, adorata right there is modifying dea. A participle is a special kind of adjective formed from a verbal root. So instead of saying adore, which is the verb, the finite verb, you can put it in the participle form adored goddess or loved goddess. The next major point is the interrogative adjective. Interrogative means it asks a question, of course. The first thing you have to know about it, though, to understand it, is that the interrogative adjective is declined, like any adjective or noun, they're declined, in exactly the same way as the relative pronoun. You learn the relative pronoun in the last lesson. There's absolutely no difference in it 
contain the nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, ablative, any gender, any number. It looks exactly the same as a relative pronoun. Here's a quick review of how that looks. Qui, qui, quod. And then every form in the genitive is quius, quius, quius. Qui in the dative, masculine, feminine, or neuter. And then quem, quam, quod. Quo, qua, quo. There's your nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and ablative singular. And then again, this has to be memorized because now it's two forms, interrogative adjective and the relative pronoun. And the plural goes qui, quai, quai. That's a problem, isn't it? But the nominative and accusative neuters are always the same, singular or plural. Quorum, 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 quibus, quibus, quibus. All the same, quos, quas, quai. And then quibus, quibus, quibus for the ablative. These are the plural. And remember, these are the forms for the relative pronoun and for the interrogative adjective. You can only tell them apart by context, just like you can tell the word to apart from the word to, apart from the word to in English. There's two, two, and two in English, and yet you can tell them apart from context. So if it seems confusing that these forms are all the same, well, you're probably not too confused usually when somebody says to, to, or to, or when someone says there versus there. You usually understand it immediately from context. And when you read it, it's clear from the spelling, but even if you just would hear it, it would be very clear to you from the context. Same with Latin. Last time you learned that the relative pronoun joins together two clauses and refers back to an antecedent. It's a kind of shorthand way to make two sentences into one. And it's called relative because relative literally means refers back. And the thing that it refers back to literally means the thing that goes before. Ante is before, kedo is go in Latin. In English, the relative pronoun is translated with the word who, whose, whom, sorry, to whom, whom, and by whom, from whom, with whom, in whom, within whom, at or on whom. That's your go-to list for the ablative. Here's what the accusative looks like in English. Here's what the dative would look like in English. Here's the genitive in English. And here's the nominative in English. So English has some remainder of the declensional forms, even though most of them have fallen off. That's a brief review of the relative pronoun. Now we move to the interrogative adjective, which is declined in exactly the same way. The interrogative adjective is an adjective that asks a question. That makes sense because it's called the interrogative adjective, so it will be translated as, for example, what blank, what goddess? Or another alternative is which blank, or which goddess, or which house, or which man, or which girl. I put in brackets the word goddess because that's my example word. It could be anything. My point is, since it's an adjective, it has to be modifying something. Adjectives describe nouns or pronouns, so this adjective, this interrogative adjective, has to be modifying something. Here's that sentence in Latin. Quae dia, it agrees in case number and gender with dia, est auctor amoris. Which goddess is the author of love? Which goddess is the creator of love? Quae is the interrogative adjective, not the relative pronoun. How do you tell that? Because in this sentence, there's a question mark after it. No one's ever going to be speaking Latin with you. You'll always have the benefit to know that this is a question because there's a question mark at the end of the sentence. Therefore, you know right away this is not a relative pronoun, even though it looks like the relative pronoun. It's got a question mark, and it modifies a noun. If it modifies a noun, it has to be an adjective. If it's got a question mark, it's going to be an interrogative adjective. What would be the nominative, or which? Then you could say whose, that would be like the genitive. For example, you see, we days, quius templum. You see the temple of whom? Or you could say, for example, to what goddess do you give a gift? Or has he given a gift? Um, he gave a gift to which goddess? 
This is in the dative, and so this is in the dative. This is an adjective modifying the noun dea. Or in the accusative, that was the dative, and in the accusative it would say something like, you see which goddess, or you see what goddess. Which or what both make sense in English. Which goddess do you see? Quam agrees with deam in case number and gender. Since deam is accusative singular feminine, quam is accusative singular feminine. And then finally you'd have by what goddess, or from what goddess, or which goddess. So for example, I could say, you saw the goddess in what temple? Quo is in the ablative singular, neuter, just like templo is in the ablative singular neuter because this is the interrogative adjective. Okay, just to keep it interesting, there's also the interrogative pronoun, which asks a question as well, but the interrogative pronoun does not modify a noun because it's a noun by itself. It's a pronoun. So, first point is that it has the same plural form as the relative pronoun and the interrogative pronoun. Relative pronoun and interrogative pronoun look exactly the same. But the plural, sorry, uh, sorry the singular is different. The singular form has to be memorized. Quis, quis, quid, masculine, feminine, neuter. Quius, 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 qui, qui, qui. Quem, quem, quid, quo, quo, quo. It's almost as if the masculine form has totally taken over the feminine form because this is normally a masculine form. You would expect qua right there. And then you would expect quo back here, but it seems to be strange. Again, quis, that looks like a good masculine form, but you would expect qui right here. So in the singular, it is different from the relative pronoun in the interrogative adjective, but in the plural, it's exactly the same form that you've already learned for the relative pronoun. So since it's a pronoun, I've already addressed this point, it doesn't need to modify a noun. It can stand on its own. Here's some examples. Quis est Atlanta? Who is Atalanta? You do, it's still asking a question, but it doesn't say, for example, which girl is Atalanta. There's no noun that quiz modifies. Quiz is its own pronoun. It's its own noun. It does not need to modify any other noun. Here's another example. Quius arbor in agrostat. He stands in the field namely the tree, the tree stands in the field of whom? Quius is its own independent agent. It is not modifying another noun. It is not an adjective. It's a pronoun standing on its own. He, she, or it, meaning the tree in this case, the tree stands in which, sorry, in the field of whom? There's your genitive. Interrogative pronoun, here's your dative. Qui Venus Poma dedit. Venus gave apples to whom? There's your relative, sorry, there's your interrogative pronoun. Quid hippomenes fake it? What has Hippomenes done? Or Hippomenes has done what? Relative pronoun. Sorry, I keep saying that interrogative pronoun. And then finally, aquo pomum yakievator. This is an interesting example because they use the passive voice here. By whom is the apple thrown, or was the apple thrown? That's the indicative, imperfect, passive voice. So the apple was thrown by whom? Here's your interrogative pronoun, aquo. 
in each example, you can notice the pattern that the interrogative pronoun comes first in the sentence. That's not necessary, but at this level, when you're dealing with pretty easy sentences, it will often be right at the beginning of the sentence. The fact that it has a question mark tells you that it's asking a question. That's a no-brainer. It means it's an interrogative pronoun. And it's really just translated again with who or which or what, making it pretty easy to keep them apart from the interrogative adjective and the relative pronoun. All these sentences are in the book too, but just so you see the translation, by whom is the apple thrown? Question mark. And what has the Palmonese done? There's your model sentences. I put them in order, unlike the book of nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and ablative. These are all singular, but of course there could be plural examples as well. The regular verb, here's your principal parts, eo, ira, two forms for the perfect, ee slash evi, or iwi, either one is fine, and then itus, ita, itum. There's your fourth principal part, which is the participle perfect passive. It has a masculine, feminine, and neuter form. This verb means to go, and it is fairly regular. Here's the indicative present active. I go, io, is, you go, eat, he, she, or it goes, imus, we go, itis, y'all go, and eunt, they go. There's your indicative, present, active for the verb to go. That's highly regular. You just have to copy this down, make flashcards, practice it. The verb isn't used as often as to be, which is also a regular, but still one that you have to drill yourself on because obviously the word go turns up regularly. Next is the indicative imperfect active. Remember to pause the screencast, obviously, if you need to write those notes down or work with something or stare at the screen a little longer. I may not pause it because I want to keep it moving at a relatively fast pace, but don't forget to do that if you need to. The indicative and perfect active gets a little bit more predictable because it's got the ba that's very regular for the imperfect. It goes ibam, ibas, ibat, ibamis, ibatis, ibant. I used to go where I was going, and of course it goes on down the line. You used to go, or you were going. He, she, or it used to go, or he, she, or it was going. We used to go, or we were going. You all used to go, or you were going. They used to go, or they were going. Either one, whichever one sounds best in the context is how you should translate it. The indicative future active is similarly somewhat regular. Note that it has the bow, bis, bit, bimis, bitis, bunt ending. That's characteristic of the first and second conjugation future. A bow, a bis, a bit, a bimis, a bitis, a bunt. Don't underestimate the value, by the way, of reciting it out loud and backwards as well. A bunt, a bitis, a bimis, a bit, a bis, a bow. That's a good way to practice it. It'll teach you not only by writing it down, but by using your ear and your uh, voice. It'll add another you know, layer of learning that'll stick in your memory even more deeply. This is the future. I will go. You will go, etc. Bo abyss a bit, abimis a bit is a boont. The perfect has two options for the principal part, so it has two options for the conjugation of the indicative perfect active. EE -E for I went or I have gone, whichever one sounds better in context. And EV means the same thing. I went or I have gone. These equal each other. There is no reason to prefer one over the other. Various authors may prefer one over the other, but there is no uh, clear winner in the preference of even the most admired uh, Latin authors. EE, -E, I went, you went, he, she, or it went, we went, you all went, they went. 
That's the perfect. That's the completed action in the past as in, uh, opposed to the imperfect, which is the not completed action in the past. I used to go. is something that is essentially still ongoing in your imagination of the past time. The indicative pluperfect or the more than perfect. Suddenly your book calls this the past perfect. That's confusing to me. Just be aware of that. The pluperfect is the standard name for this, especially in Latin studies. In French, it's plus que parfait, so of course there's different names for it in different languages, but in all Latin textbooks I've ever seen, and I've taught out of about seven at this point, they call it the pluperfect. In this chapter, I noticed your book called it the past perfect. Same, same idea. Again, you have two options. You have the stem that has the I, or you have the stem that has the IV, because it forms from the third principal part, the perfect, pluperfect, both. And this would be, I had gone. And this one would be, I had gone. Pick whichever one you want if you're writing letters to your Latin pen pals, but otherwise you just have to be prepared to translate them. Of course, there's the future perfect as well. That's one tense, the future perfect, has two potential options again because it's formed from the third principal part and the third principal part has two options. E arrow would be I had, sorry, future perfect, I will have gone. Future perfect, I will have gone. You probably do not use that tense too often, either do the Romans, but it is a real tense and it does come up occasionally. I will have gone, you will have gone, he, she, or it will have gone. We will have gone. Easy enough. Follows the regular pattern of a pluperfect, uh, sorry, a future perfect. Basically adding the ending of ero, eris, erit, erimis, eritis, erint with an I. That's somewhat unusual. Same pattern on the other side. Ero, eris, erit, erimis, eritis, erint. Just like the pluperfect follows the pattern of eram, eras, erat, eramis, eratis, erant. This is regular as far as its ending. It's just irregular in regard to its stem and some of its principal parts. As if it wasn't enough information already in this chapter, the book also gives you the declension of the number three, trace. Trace, trace, tria is how it would look in the dictionary, by the way. Trace, trace, tria. Here's the nominative masculine, nominative feminine, nominative neuter. And it's one of the numbers that's actually declined. After a certain point, Latin stops declining its numbers, although it does have a bit of a declension for the number 1,000. So 1, 2, and 3 are fully declined with the nominative, genitive, genitive, dative, accusative, ablative uh, forms and masculine, feminine, and neuter. And then you get up to certain other numbers like 100 and 1,000, uh, are also declined. So trace, trace, tria. Trium, 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 all the way across for the genitive. Tribus, tribus, tribus for the dative. Trace, trace, trace for the accusative. And of course, tribus, tribus, tribus for the ablative again. This is the plural because three is more than one. So it does not have a singular form. This is only the um, plural form of three. It would be illogical for you to have the singular of the number three. So it only appears in the plural. Yet, a number yet another irregularity that must be memorized. You've got to sit down and do the work for real now because all of this will pile up and it'll just become nonsense to your brain. You'll have some vague memory of it if you've watched these podcasts and taken the quizzes and done the exercise in the book. But I really think at this point, at this point in the semester and the year, you need to be memorizing these on a regular basis and working and reviewing all the time. You only have to do probably 10 minutes five days a week in addition to the homework. But if you don't do those five or 10 minutes a day, five days a week, it's going to, the class is going to get progressively more impossible for you. Naturally, milia, milia, milium, milibus, milia, milibus also appears only in the plural, and there really are no case endings for it. It's not masculine, feminine, neuter are all the same. Masculine, feminine, neuter, masculine, feminine, neuter, masculine, feminine, neuter, all the same, all the way across. It doesn't matter whether you've got a thousand of anything. It's always going to be 
the same, masculine, feminine, or neuter. Now, what's interesting about Amelia is that it's got to be followed by whatever gender, it doesn't matter, um, a genitive. So, for example, that should be plural. Um, it's a funny way to translate it, but this, at least from English perspective, this says a thousand, or probably better to translate, just thousands of girls. This milia means thousands of the totality of girls. So whatever case ending you're going to put in there, whatever gender, it doesn't matter. That was a feminine example. It has to be followed. The word milia has to be followed by a genitive. So, sorry, that's the same one. Thousands of girls, I meant to write boys. Thousands of girls. You're going to follow this with a genitive. Thousands of boys. Of boys. And again, that may be awkward to say in English all the time, the of, but it is used with a genitive. Now the word milia can also be in the genitive itself. You could say milium uh, puellarum. It doesn't agree exactly in case number and gender because again, it doesn't really seem to have a gender, they're all the same. And this always has to be followed by a genitive, so this again means of girls, but this means of thousands of girls. You could say, I've broken the hearts of thousands of girls. Whereas this sentence down here in the nominative, the first example I gave you would say, thousands of girls are here. This is the nominative milia. This is the genitive milia, so you can use them all in different sentences. So you could say it in the dative, too. I gave money to thousands of boys. Boys, though, the noun that follows it always has to be in the genitive. It's part of the whole. It's something that you'll learn later, officially called the genitive of the whole. But as long as you always translate the genitive with the word of, you'll get it right every time. You don't need to know the fancy names. Don't worry, there's still more. The passive, it's a simple point though, the passive voice of the verb video is usually translated as seem rather than is seen. Is seen is just too awkward in English. So the passive voice means the subject receives the action. But really, when you do this verb video, it's going to come out better every time if you use seem rather than are seen or is seen. For example, duo transumum corsum volare widentor the two duo are seen would be how you might translate this indicative present passive third person plural the two are seen to fly volare across the top of the course the two are seen to fly over the top of the course. It doesn't really mean that though. It means the two seem to fly over the top of the course. They're running so fast that those two seem to fly over the race course. I get an awkward sense from the book, but the two seem to fly is a much better sense than the two are seen to fly. He seems to be very intelligent rather than he is seen to be very intelligent. In Latin, you would rather say, I'm sorry, in English, you'd rather say he seems to be bright or he seems bright rather than he is seen bright. He is seen intelligent. Is seen is just too awkward. Use seems when you have the indicative present passive or any passive form of the verb video. I was going to review the relative pronoun down here a little bit, but I think you've got enough for this lesson. I may have to give you an additional podcast with a with a um, review material because it is so much in the recent chapters, and you'll have a quiz to go with this podcast in this chapter to help you review as well. Remember to take advantage of taking those quizzes twice. You can get me on Skype at Sean E Lake. Make sure you add me and write me an email if I don't add you right away on Skype. So if you need to get in touch with me, and I think that's enough for now. Good luck. 
and make sure to put in your work memorizing every week.